All right. All right, hello everybody and uh, welcome to this second webinar of um, 2022 um, on uh, from Open Access Australasia. Just the usual practicalities, uh, if you don't mind, um, if you could all keep your um, your videos off and your um, and yourself muted as we go through. Uh, we will record this webinar posted on the website with the slides afterwards, um, in addition to another um, yeah, further um, uh, in information about the uh, infrastructures that we're going to hear about today. Um, if you could type your questions into the chat and I'll read them out and interview Martin and Angus at the end and we'll have plenty of time for questions and we'll fin finish uh, on or just before the hour. So my name is Ginny Barber, I'm the Director of Open Access Australasia uh, and I'm really pleased today to be um, supporting this, uh, this webinar which we're going to hear about making the ca case for SCOS uh, from Martin Borshut who is Chair of the SCOS Board and who very recently was uh, the Chair of Open Access Australasia the Executive Board and Angus Cook, the Director of Content Procurement at Call. Uh, for those of you that don't know Open Access Australasia, we're a, a membership organisation of 28 or, uh, mem universities across Australia and New Zealand, and we also have a membership which includes uh, Creative Commons Australia, Toa Toa in New Zealand, uh, the ALIA in Australia, the Australian Digital Alliance and Wikimedia Australia. Um, and we work for open access across the entire spectrum of uh, open access infrastructures and um, uh, processes and we support a diversity of models, which is one of the reasons why we're particularly interested in the work that SCOS is doing. So before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on, um, the Turrbal and the Yagara people. I'm based in QUT in Southeast Queensland. Um, UNSW, which is the host organisation of uh, Open Access Australasia, is located on Bedigal and Gadigal lands of the Aora Nation in Sydney Basin. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who may be present here today and to acknowledge uh, their important work. So first off, um, I am going to start by uh, sharing a video, which is an introduction to SCOS, uh, which has been uh, pre-recorded by Agata Morka, who uh, is the coordinator of SCOS. She's in Europe and it would be the middle of the night for her to be doing this. So she has kindly recorded this introduction. This goes for about 12 minutes and this will also be available on the webinar after, on the website after, afterwards. So just give me a moment to get that up. Okay, I'll play this now. Let me know if there's any concerns. Hello, my name is Agatha. Oh, I am SCOS coordinator, and I am here today to give you a short intro to SCOS. So I will talk a little bit about what SCOS is, what it is that we do, why we do it, and how we do it. SCOS. The abbreviation stands for the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services. How is it that we came into existence? Why was SCOS established? Um, so at the very core of SCOS lies a certain challenge. So we can see that there are more and more open infrastructures um, that are being created um, in the scholarly communications ecosystem. However, Many of them are run by volunteers, many of them uh, use uh, short term project money, and once this money is um, done, once they use all of it, um, there is the question of sustainability that comes into play. Um, of course, we are all <clears throat> we are all here for um, for an equitable and inclusive research culture. And in order uh, for this uh, culture to be uh, that way, we definitely need open science infrastructure, which is, um, which is non-commercial and which is community governed. Um, because otherwise, of course, um, we risk, um, first of all, we risk that the services that this, this open um, science infrastructure offer that they will risk stagnation, downsizing, or even worse, uh, paywalling. So they might be bought out by some commercial entities. And of course, this is not how, um, at least how SCOS imagines 
a thriving research um, research culture. So, with more and more um, more and more initiatives, uh, more and more open science infrastructures being created, we see that uh, we become more dependent on that. Um, and the question of their sustainability becomes even more crucial. So SCOS, um, this is where SCOS comes in. We were established in early 2017, and our purpose was to provide a certain coordinated cost-sharing framework that would ultimately enable the broader open access and open science community to support non-commercial services on which it depends. And um, I think that our main aim is to help sustain the infrastructure uh, to support the implementation of open science. So this is uh, SCOS in a nutshell. Um, we looked very closely at the, at the question of sustainability of open science infrastructure in a report um, that we published um, recently we asked some of our um, some of the participating infrastructures, which were both small local ones and also big international ones. We asked them how much time, how how long would they be able to remain viable uh, without uh, grants or without without uh, uh, any funding. And uh, as you can see from the graph that we are looking at and now, the results were rather alarming because. <clears throat> we have almost 20% of them saying that they wouldn't be able to make it um, for more than a month. And we also have almost 50% saying that they would remain viable for more than a year only, which of course, it's not a long-term plan. Um, so here is where SCOS uh, comes in again. Um, and this is, uh, so our organization is community led and governed. And what we do is we create connections. We create, we create connections between open science infrastructures, which are in need of funding and possible pledgers. So institutions around the world who are willing to support open science infrastructure. It's important to remember and to stress that SCOS itself is not a subscription or payment agency. We do not collect any money. We facilitate relationships between the infrastructures and the funders, the possible funders. Um, of course, um, we have uh, a lot of members that recognize the importance of um, what SCOS is doing and the importance of sustaining, uh, of sustaining open science infrastructure or of finding ways of sustaining open science infrastructure, because of course, what SCOS proposes is just a way of approaching this challenge, of approaching this problem is not the only way. Um, among our members, we are very happy to have some of really um, large organizations, such as, for example, the Council of Australian University Librarians, Association of Research Libraries, the Canadian Re Research Knowledge Network, LIBER, Association of African Universities, the French Ministry of um, Higher Education um, and <clears throat> Research and Innovation, or the Qatar National Library. Those are only some of the members uh, that we now have um, supporting SCOS in our mission. And um, I think that mm, the most important one to mention is Spark Europe, because SCOS is originally an initiative of Spark Europe. Um, last year, we were at the point where we wanted to look back at what we have achieved so far. Um, it's been three years, three, almost four years since SCOS uh, was founded in 2017. And we decided that we needed a clear direction uh, for the future. Um, and this is how the strategy 2022-2024 was created. We managed to voice uh, what it exact what it actually exactly it is that we um, find to be our mission and our vision, and I think that these two um, two sentences you see on the screen describe SCOS in a nutshell. So the mission we create connections to sustain vital open science infrastructure, and our vision is a world 
where research is supported but by a sustainable and thriving ecosystem of open science infrastructure. In the SCOS strategy, um, we focused on three main goals. So the first one is to promote the sustainability of open science infrastructure through, through funding and support. So this is primarily what SCOS does. <clears throat> we are looking for uh, available funding for open science infrastructure. Um, the second goal is about raising global awareness about the value of non-commercial open science infrastructure through advocacy and connection building. And the third goal has to do with trust. So uh, to build and maintain trust in open science infrastructure through vetting and selection. The vetting process lies at the core of SCOS. What we do is every year we have a call um, where we invite open science infrastructures to um, express their interest in becoming uh, one of the SCOS umbrella, um, umbrella infra infrastructures projects. Um, we receive many submissions and then we vet them. We find um, among all of, all of these proposals that we get, we find infrastructures that we find to be truly vital and uh, truly worth of um, support coming from the community. And we do it every year. Uh, so far, we have run three pledging rounds with over 290 institutions um, pledging from all over the world, from 22 countries. And uh, so far, we took eight infrastructures on board in three separate pledging cycles. We are very happy to say that um, we managed through SCOS, we managed to gather almost 4 million euro to support open science infrastructure. And I wanted to tell you a little bit more about each of the cycles, um, these three cycles, which, uh, which are still open. So um, first of all, we have the pilot cycle where um, we had Sherpa Romeo and DOAJ, Directory of Open Access Journals, and DOAJ actually uh, reached its, tar it, uh, its target, uh, which we are very happy to, to see, whereas Sherpa Romeo is still at 50%, so they still need our support. This is, of course, not to say that once the infrastructure reaches its pledging target through SCOS, that it means that it will be then sustained forever and that this is, the, this is uh, their happy end. Of course not. This is just the beginning of a very, very long journey. But we are happy to be here to facilitate at least um, the first step in this long term, uh, hopefully long term sustainability. So speaking of infrastructures that have managed to uh, reach their target, in our second cycle, we had we have DOAB and OAPEN, and they also managed to reach their target just last year. We have two other infrastructures in this cycle that are still getting there. So we have open citations, which are currently, they are currently at 39% of their target. And then we have PKP, the public knowledge project, which is currently at 42%. So as you can see, there is still a long way to go, especially for these, for these two infrastructures. And last year, we also launched our third funding cycle with three new infrastructures that we took on board. So in this cycle, we support Archive, Redalic America, and DSpace. And since the launch, which took place in September last year, we already received several pledges that put Archive at 15% of their, of their target. Redalic America is currently at 8% and D space is at 10%. So they are at the very beginning of their cycle. Um, and um, I'm sure that you will hear from all of them today um, a little bit more about what it is that they do, um, what their sustainability issues are, what kind of challenges they, they face, and how they would like to use the money that hopefully they will be able to gather through generous pledges for, for the third SCOS round. Um, we, uh, we will, uh, as I said, we will hear more from each infrastructure. Um, and if you would like 
to, um, to know more about how to pledge, whom to contact for pledging, please do consult our website first. This is where we have all the information. I think that that's a wonderful first step. You can also always contact me as the SCOS coordinator. And if you are not doing uh, this yet, please do follow us on Twitter and also subscribe to our newsletter to keep up to date um, with where we are with pledges, what it is that the next steps for SCOS will be. Thank you. Okay, I hope that was a useful introduction for everybody. Um, as Agata mentioned, there is further information on each of these infrastructures and Martin is going to give an overview of that. And we also have longer videos that will be will make available on our website afterwards. Um, so I'll now pass over to Martin to uh, share his presentation and to talk further about these infrastructures. Thanks, Ginny. I'm just going to share my slides. Is that working okay, Ginny? Uh, it's not in presenter mode. Uh, we're seeing you. We're seeing it in um, uh, the kind of the presenter mode. Present if in, you just yeah, if you just it, sort of display settings, then we'll it's, see. It's, it. it's in. The, it is in presenter mode on my machine. Um, uh, we're seeing both first, second slides. So, how's that? Yeah. Is that presenter mode? If you just go to display settings at the top and then do swap presenter and we're seeing two slides at a time at the moment. Is that better? Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay, great, terrific. So thanks, Jenny. Hi, everybody. Um, um, it's nice uh, to see you all again, um, but this time joining you as a partner uh, from SCOS. Um, I'd also like to just start with acknowledgement of the Bedigal and Gadigal peoples um, here um, at UNSW, who are the traditional owners. And also acknowledge, um, also like to make an acknowledgement um, also of the Indigenous peoples from around the world. So just to put, um, I think, a few words for me um, here in context with everybody else. Um, so you've just heard the, you know, the opening session from Agata. Um, we've done that so that everyone around the world gets the same. Um, also, just to acknowledge her role um, has been uh, that she was appointed with SCOS um, about a year ago. Um, I'm joining you today um, also as the call representative on the SCOS board. Um, I'm also the chair of the SCOS board. Um, I've just started uh, my third uh, term of two years, and this will be my final term also, um, also in that role as core representative on the SCOS board. Um, and you probably already know that I'm also university librarian at University of New South Wales. Um, I'm just gonna bring out also a few slides uh, and talk to those. Um, those slides are also in the infrastructure presentations, so you'll be hearing them within context. So I do recommend that you listen to the half hour also of presentations from the infrastructure there. Um, they'll give you a lot of context about, um, with that about each of the infrastructure in the third round. Um, so you'll be able to look at those in your own time. So today I was really just going to talk to some of the usage slides, um, which talk about usage of Australia and also like in New Zealand uh, with each of the three infrastructure in the third round. Um, I will also say in my intro too, um, that SCOS does a lot of work around vetting. Um, so we do a call, as you heard from Agata, um, we review also, um, you know, um, we review all the submissions that we get from infrastructure. Um, we then invite infrastructure um, who we have on the shortlist uh, to give a larger, you know, like amount of information on the proposal. Um, 
we vet those and, and we have a relationship talking with those infrastructure about their proposals. Um, then if they make the final list, we do a work plan with them um, and we align the money that they're looking for um, to help their sustainability with the work plan. And I want to assure you too um, that also um, that SCOS also looks at the annual reviews from each of the infrastructure and we look at how they're working towards their work plan and how they're spending the money. Okay, um, so you've seen this slide already from Agata looking at archive and redelect, also looking like um, at like a D space. So uh, my plea for you is to please think about um, with those how you could support those. Um, I mean, in the funding cycle, they have a long way to go to reach their targets. Without funding, they won't be able to achieve their work plans over three years. Um, so it's very important. Um, each, each of those infrastructure, they can invoice you in different ways. Um, it, uh, it could be invoiced as a donation. Um, it could be invoiced as a membership, for example, um, or it can be invoiced um, you know, like as you would normally do with a subscription. So whatever suits your organization, they can do. Um, they also all provide a member service of some form um, as well. Um, these organizations have all been operating now for some time. So, you know, they have those sort of membership uh, services that you can engage in um, if you wish to. So archive, um, you should listen to that video, which comes from Alison from. Um, she's a coordinator there. Um, it's really interesting uh, video to, to watch. I recommend you watch it. But if I just pull out the usage statistics, um, you can see the increase in the numbers of files which are put through the submission process with archive all the way since 1991. Their downloads now are in the billions as well. Um, you can look at the uploads. There's also been very large increase in uploads as well. So you can see the upswing in the uploads there in the time during the pandemic as well. Um, and there are millions of monthly users and there are submissions coming from 140 countries. So it's really large scale and very impressive. Um, so these are the submission ranks, okay, which comes from institutions in New Zealand. Um, so you can see at the top of the list there, University of Auckland um, and some other institutions are ranked, you know, sort of quite, you know, up there highly in the international ranking of our submissions. So there is a, you know, so there is, there's a substantial usage there from New Zealand. You can look at that list in detail later. Um, this is the Australian snapshots um, of, um, of ranking of submissions within the global rank. Um, so there are quite, so we have a couple in the top 100. Um, there are quite a few universities in the top 1000. Um, so Again, you know, there's a lot of usage um, here from Australia. And I think this is really given to you, encourage you to pledge um, and to consider the value. You may be able to reach out to some academics um, in your institution and talk to them, for example. So looking at archive two, um, just calling out a few of the sustainability issues um, that they have and that they're putting that work into their work plan using the funding which is pledged. Um, so they've had large increases in submissions but haven't really increased their resources. Um, also parts of the service are relying uh, on older code, uh, which they want to um, rework as well. Um, they want to update uh, the interfaces and workflows and move to the cloud. Um, so that's uh, archive, that's the work that they'll be doing. 
could see the number of new papers. Gretelik, um, it's a similar story. I recommend that you watch the video from Ariana. Um, you might, I think you've already seen, I think you've already seen a presentation from Ariana. Um, so she is a, the executive director of Redalip. Um, so here's global usage in a sort of heat map. Um, we, you can see Australia and New Zealand. Um, so, you know, so Redalip is really sharing resources um, in a range of languages uh, to the Americas and to Central and Latin America. But we do have some usage in Australia and New Zealand. Remember that this is a global pledge round, so you know we fit um, into that as well. There's very very high levels of usage there um, as well that you can see on the slide. Um, and looking at the users in like in New Zealand, um, there are quite you know like there are actually quite a number of users um, here in New Zealand. Um, at different city locations, so you can see that, but with 8,000 users identified um, by Redlink. In Australia, there's state by state um, usage that's shown. Um, they haven't given us institutional usage. Again, the work plan, in some ways, it's a similar work plan. Uh, they want to update their infrastructure uh, to be able to meet with a demand. Um, they want to um, increase, I think, the response times uh, with bandwidth as well. Um, and basically just to strengthen their, their infrastructure they're doing. So, uh, so please have a think about that for pledging. The last one is like the D space. Um, there's a presentation for um, you there as well. I recommend that you watch that uh, from Michael Aminelli um, from D space. Um, and again, we've got the circle map here um, with Australia and, and also like the New Zealand. Um, again, it's a global pledge round, so you can see. Um, countries that are using DSpace are for their repositories. Um, this is a map showing uh, some DSpace installations. I don't think it necessarily includes all the DSpace installations in Australia. I'm aware of a couple that are probably not showing um, on the map, uh, but there's a large number of institutions using DSpace here in Australia and um, a large number also using um, also DSpace in New Zealand. So please have a think about that um, as well also for pledging. Um, I know that some of these organizations also have other ways to pledge. So, you know, they're not asking you to, you know, like for you to pledge in a number of different ways, but you can pledge through SCOS. Um, they're also having uh, some issues around sustainability. Um, they want to um, increase, I think, uh, the capacity uh, for them to do development as well. Um, they've really been using a volunteer model, um, but they want to move to a paid model, which I will help accelerate uh, the development as well. Um, they also want to increase engagement um, with their partners as well. Mm. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, just final reminder though, I think you really should watch this video uh, from the infrastructure, um, really provides a really good overview and introduction as well. Uh, so thank you. Uh, so I'll finish my sharing there. Thank you. And I think we're handing over to Angus now. Thanks very much, Martin. And yes, I've just put the link to the page where the videos will be. Um, and over to Angus now. Great. Thanks, Ginny. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'd like to just begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Warren people as the traditional owners of the land that I am on. And uh, I am the Director of Content Procurement for Call, and we've been um, proud to be associated um, with SCOS uh, for some years now. 
uh, as it says, a lot of reasons um, why we believe that this is a, a very worthy activity um, for us. Uh, and I think the principal one is that we, as you're probably all aware, very involved in developing agreements for open access through read and publish and transformative agreements. Um, but in line with that, we think it's very important to support the infrastructure uh, that actually support those agreements. And it's sort of quite interesting in, in recent months to hear how some of the you know, products like Sherpa Romeo uh, are being used to sort of enhance and, and support some of the, the data and agreements that we have uh, through members using Sherpa Romeo themselves. So um, I think it's quite reassuring then to know that we're, we're supporting those and I'll go through the infrastructure that we provide um, for that support. So sustainable open science services, um, obviously um, very, very important. Um, as you remember from uh, the video at the beginning, SCOS uh, does not collect uh, the money. Um, it just really facilitates um, the agreements. And I'll go through now um, what the practicalities and the, and the workflows are for that. Um, so um, in the past few years when we've been supporting these projects, um, basically um, what we do is we um, list the funding uh, projects on Consortium Manager. So anyone with any role with acquisitions or procurement or for any of the content coordinators uh, at the institutions um, that are on this call will be very familiar um, with this process because we we run this process pretty much the same way that we run um, the agreements with the commercial publishers. Uh, so the agreement is listed on Consortium Manager. Um, member institutions confirm their pledge amounts in Consortium Manager. Uh, and again, that's a, a very similar workflow to the commercial agreements. Uh, and then what happens is that once we reach the deadline uh, for all members to pledge to a certain project, call will invoice uh, the member institutions on behalf of the project itself. So not on behalf of SCOS, we actually invoice um, in the name of the project. Uh, and then once um, we've done, invoiced all the members, um, collected all the money for that, um, the project will invoice call. So some, some benefits uh, to everyone for that. Um, it's a familiar system. Uh, and then for libraries, the benefit is that the members are being invoiced by one entity uh, being called, uh, rather than having to set up payment profiles in their systems for several um, individual organisations, for several um, individual um, projects. Um, and, and as Martin said, um, we, we've got flexibility about um, what the invoice says, if you need it to say it's a pledge or, or, for, or if it's for a service or it's a membership, just let us know. Um, and we can invoice accordingly. So um, today we've collected nearly 500,000 Australian uh, uh, dollars um, for these projects. And uh, I'm sure this is an activity that we'll um, continue to, to work with. So the amounts for each um, project uh, for a large institution, which is over 20,000 FTE, uh, the suggested annual pledge amount is 4,000 euros and then 2,000 uh, for a smaller institution. A 25% discount will be applied if 10 or more consortium members subscribe, uh, except for archive, which is a 10% discount. Uh, the pledges are annual with a three year um, suggested commitment. This is why we call them round one, round two, round three for the same projects. Um, but we really want to stress here uh, that members are welcome to pledge any amount, large or small, um, from any amount upwards of, of 500 euros. Uh, so if those numbers sort of don't look achievable, but you do have something that you can contribute, then, uh, then please um, let us know. We can adjust the amount in Consortium Manager and then that can be approved and we can invoice accordingly. Uh, and then the other thing to just remind everyone um, is that, um, uh, and again, as, as in the video, uh, as per comment from Martin, members can pledge um, to any of the current or previous projects. So uh, if, say, Sherpa Romeo or, or DOAJ, um, DOAB, one of the previous projects is something that you'd like to go back and support, let us know. Uh, and even if the funding round is finished, uh, not listed in consortium manager, we'd be happy to facilitate um, payments for that as well. So fairly straightforward. Um, 
speak to the content coordinator or procurement staff at your institution uh, in working with us to organize the pledges, um, to make a pledge at your institution, all the details there in consortium manager, uh, information about the projects, um, the leaflets or brochures for each project are there as an attachment on the agreement in consortium manager. Um, consider the pledge, I speak to your staff, uh, and then currently the um, projects that are currently listed in consortium manager there for round one, uh, archive readout, Melica and DSpace. Now that's got a confirmation deadline coming up, um, 31st of March. Let us know if you do want to contribute um, to those projects, but that deadline is a little bit short for you. I'm sure we can extend that um, if we need to, that shouldn't be a problem. And then a little bit of a longer deadline for the other three projects, DOAB, Open Public Knowledge Project, and Open Citations, where the deadline for those um, is at the end of May. So that's um, all I wanted to cover um, with the um, practicalities. Um, the, if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or just email me directly and I'll get back to you or one of my colleagues will. Thanks. Great, thanks very much, Angus. Thanks very much, Martin. Um, uh, I've just I've just seen one question in the chat, which I'll um, which is just a very practical one to you first, Angus, and then I've, I'll kick off perhaps with something. Um, so it's actually from Claire Thorpe. So she said that the uh, just questioning whether it's three hundred and seventy five euros is the suggested amount or five hundred euros is the minimum pledge. Do you have a um, can you just clarify that perhaps? I would need to go back uh, and check on that because the suggested amounts are, are 4,000 for a large institution or um, 5,000 for a, sorry, 2,000 for a small one. Um, so 375 looks like it's had the 25% the discount applied already, but yeah, I'll need to just go back and have a look at that, that for you, Claire. Great, thanks very much, Angus. Um, so perhaps, can I just start quick off by asking a question, I, I guess to both of you really, perhaps Martin first off, how important do you think it is to, you know, simplify the process of supporting these organisations in actually ensuring they get some support? I mean, I, I perhaps, I mean, I know this is something that SCOS has done a great, great amount of work on. I think that's really important. And that's actually why we have SCOS. So SCOS was designed uh, through the members and through Spark Europe, um, to create a process where we do all the work, where we call for proposals, we vet them, we have negotiations, um, we do work plans, uh, we do annual reviews as well. So what we're really doing to help all the institutions to pledge is that we do a lot of the work behind the scenes to make it easy for you. And I think the broad representation from around the world um, really helps because we get a lot of different views. Um, as well and we acknowledge the diversity that we're trying to put through the infrastructure that uh, we present also uh, for funding so you know they're from different parts of the world also using different you know also um also where we categorize resources by different sort of categories of open access um as well and open infrastructure and open science so there's a lot of complexity behind the scenes so we're trying to present to you something um, which has had a lot of work put it into into it already, which is going to simplify it for you. I hope. Yeah, that cert that certainly comes across. Um, one thing that I think people have also uh, asked about in the past is um, support for upcoming organisations. That that do you want to just perhaps have a let, let us know why? Because the ones that SCOS supports now are, are relatively established and uh, kind of already very important within the ecosystem. Are there, what you know, do you get approached by organisations that are just starting off and what's your approach to those? Um, that's a really good question. Um, so in the call for proposals, we do, we have been asking till now um, that infrastructure um, already established for two years. So we've had some infrastructure which uh, have been established for a long time. And certainly um, in this round, round three, we've seen that. Um, in previous rounds, there have been infrastructure which haven't been established for much more than two years. So we do offer a diversity of that. Um, I, I will let you know though, that when we do the calls, um, 
around um, and we do the vetting, um, we always have we always have a lot more infrastructure um, to give us a proposal than we have capacity to support. So we tend to choose only three. So um, and then we look also at the diversity around the world for what to support. Yeah, I think in time, as as we have over time, we've worked with a greater number of infrastructure. We might see more infrastructure that haven't been running for as long, perhaps make the short list. Yeah. Great, thanks, Martin. Um, so the question from the chat, which is about uh, it's so with the funding round, what length of time are the targets designed to cover? Um, uh, for example, three years, and this concept of you know is the DOJ now okay since they've met their target? What's what's the thinking about that? Yeah. Um, so yes, we have planned these as a, we have planned these as a three year term uh, for infrastructure to be supported through SCOS and to reach their target. Um, when an infrastructure reaches its target um, within the three years, we do allow them to also create another work plan, like a second work plan, and then to call for funds for that. Um, and in the same way, we vet that in the same way, and we do annual reviews as well. Um, the reason why we've done three years is just that it will allow um, I think libraries and organisations um, to support, um, for example, like a range of infrastructure. Um, but um, it, it's only for three years initially. And of course, of course, you know, those infrastructure want to operate in the long term. So um, we're just having talks at the moment about how we can support infrastructure beyond the three years in a better way. Um, they can actually uh, submit for another term of three years, but we haven't yet chosen an infrastructure to support out of the three for another three years. Um, but we do help them um, to establish uh, the processes and systems for engagement um, and also uh, to gain pledges from around the world. So once they've worked with us, they should have the systems up and running. Um, and I also know Angus and I, um, are also starting to talk a bit more about, about how that can be worked through call as well on the term. Great, thanks for that, Martin. Um, so just a question about the shrinking budgets. So the, uh, yeah, with Australian New Zealand universities facing current shrinking budget scenarios, and I guess that's also true elsewhere, are these pledge funds being reviewed to the market available? So kind of scaled as appropriate. Yeah. So uh, we do global comms from SCOS um, and we keep it global. So um, that's where um, you can vary your pledge according to your own situation. Um, and for example, my university, um, we had, you know, we had a couple of years there where budget was really tight. So we reviewed our pledge in accordance with what we thought we could manage. And that's fine. And situations are going to change in different parts of the world at different times. Yeah, and I, so I think this concept of being able to do a minimum amount, you know, which is relatively small, is is very important. At least it kind of keeps these infrastructures on people's agenda, which I think is an incredibly important role for this. Um, Angus, can I just ask you a question about the process for this? I mean, I think the consortium manager that Call has has really made doing this kind of work supporting open infrastructure is much easier. Do you see there's a role in other areas to support? Um, and how much work is it for you to set these kind of things up to, to manage? It's not too much work for us because um, so long as they follow up our standard processes, um, it, it's relatively yeah, straightforward. We have 118 agreements in the consortium manager. Um, the, I suppose the, the, the thing that's a little bit tricky for us with these agreements is that they don't follow the pattern of all of the other agreements which follow a calendar year. Um, and I think um, perhaps at the end of the year, um, when some institutions might have a little bit of budget left over, um, that might be a good point to, to come back and remind people about the um, opportunities uh, still being available to um, support SCOS. Uh, so, um, we you know, certainly want to do everything that we can to support um, open science. Um, and if it's practical, if we've got the resources to do it, then we will. 
Yeah, great. Thing. I think that's that's the really key thing, isn't it? It comes back to this idea of making it easy for people to participate rather than having some sort of complex negotiation you have to do individually. Um, um, OK, so a question, another question from the chat is that do you get feedback from pledges that they've cut normal expenditure to redirect into SCOS projects? That's uh, the idea of, I guess, supporting more open things as opposed to perhaps the traditional subscriptions. Um, so in three years, we've gone from a process of no pledges to the third year. So there is a sort of year on year effect um, as well. Um, at SCOS and Spark Europe, um, we see changes happening across the various markets with what's happening. For example, like the timing of the rounds tends to differ a little bit. It de I think it depends very much on the cycles in libraries and governments um, with their pledges um, as well. Um, so within global messaging, you know, we're quite happy to work with areas of the globe and what works with them best. And, and so that's why we do these webinars to hear from you, um, to answer your questions um, as well. And you know the amounts of money which we're recommending are not very high, really. Um, and we also offer a flexible option. So we're really trying to do everything we can. So people are not really having, say, for example, to cut back on a subscription budget to support SCOS. It's coming from, do you think it's coming from other sources of revenue or where, where do you have a sense that the revenue is coming from perhaps? So, yeah, so, um, We've gone for a model where, where the contributions from each organisation or consortium are relatively small, but we have contributions from a growing number of organisations and libraries and governments. So that's the sort of model that, you know, that we're aiming for um, as well. Um, in Australia, um, we have seen, and maybe Angus can talk to this, we've seen a reduction last year in the pledges so um, I, obviously that's going to be in response, I think, uh, to budgets, but please have a think about um, whether you can make a small contribution. Um, for example, if I can just talk about what's happened at my library, we've lost a lot of budget. Um, we've still kept pledging a small amount, but you know, we've also had to review all the commercial subscriptions and payments. And we've had a huge number of changes to what our library has available now in our library collection. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think just keeping going with the pledges, no matter how small, is, is really important because it makes it gives the, the pledges visibility on the budget line. It means that when you look at your budget last year, you go, okay, if there's the, the pledges that we made, are we going to do that again? It, it'll um, bring those pledges back into the discussion. If no pledge is made, then it doesn't appear anywhere. Um, so it's a, it's a good reminder uh, having it there uh, on, on the budget line. But certainly, you know, Paul wants to do everything that we can um, so that once the decision has been made, the actual process uh, and the invoicing is as easy as possible um, for, you to, um, for those payments uh, to be facilitated. Yeah, thanks for that. I think that's exactly right. The, the importance of having this on budget lines and so it gets carried over from year to year is, is incredibly important. And, you know, it's this concept of, you know, the library choosing to invest in, in supporting open infrastructure is, I think, incredibly uh, you know, important for us to be thinking about as we go forward. Um, so I think we're getting to the end of questions. Is there anything, Martin or Angus, you wanted to sort of end with um, uh, to sort of just finish up the webinar? Uh, my only comment is that um, if you can find 500 euros and then we get to 10 subscribers, then there's either a 10% or 25% discount. Um, it's not a lot of money, but it makes a big difference um, if we run that across the sector and plus other regions of the world. So we're really looking to have, you know, we're looking to have small amounts of money come from many institutions and consortium and governments to reach the goals, yeah. 
I think this goes back to this uh, this idea that you know subscribe originally meant to underwrite, and I think what we what you're kind of propose what you're doing here is underwriting the really sort of the core core, core um, things that keep the keep the sort of an open world working. I think in many ways, and I think that's a that's an incredibly invaluable service. Uh, oh, there's one final question, uh, which is about whether research software projects are likely to be eligible and considered as infrastructure. Did you want to jump into that one, Martin? Yeah, sure. Um, so they could be uh, considered eligible. Um, at the moment, we're still looking for established services and we're still looking for global reach and usage and impact. And generally, because of the number of infrastructure we still have applying, um, we, we're generally looking for infrastructure that support a broad range of areas in research, you know, so not, you know, not, we aren't yet um, um, uh, choosing infrastructure that supports only one academic uh, discipline. Yeah. yeah, that may come in future, but at the moment with what we're getting, we're choosing the bigger ones, yeah. Great, thank you for that. And I would just say to everybody, have a look at the SCOS website if you want more information on the types of infrastructure that's supported. It's very um, comprehensive. Um, so thank you very much, Martin and Angus. I think that was incredibly useful and as a sort of remote thank you to Agata for her introduction. Um, we'll put all the website, all the slides up on our website. Um, and if you have any uh, questions, uh, Martin and Angus and Agata will be very happy to answer them. So thank you very much, and we'll see you at our next webinar uh, in about a month's time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks, Angus.